kind of rain place. Your midterm's just right around the corner. So I thought I would spend just a few minutes talking about uh, some information that you probably need to review, pay attention to before you go into the midterm. And the first thing I'm going to talk about, you know, go back to Kenneth Arrow's article. And, and again, depending on which economist you talk to, they will argue that it is the, you know, the driving article, driving document that started the snowball of changes uh, in the in early to mid 60s. So it, again, his article generated or, or it actually published in 63. And then in 65, we started getting movement and, you know, Medicare was implemented, Medicaid's implemented 66. It was Champus, which later, become TRICARE, later became TRICARE. There were some sweeping changes started in, on the commercial side of healthcare, the provision of healthcare, contracting, code sets, billing practices, just a lot of things kind of snowballed along. And, and you know, that I'll have to, I have to agree with most economists that this was kind of the article that may have jump started the process. And what what Arrow talked about, and he gave his um, ideas of the healthcare environment. And again, this article was, you know, might have been written in the late 50s, early 60s to be published in 63. Kind of hard to say, uh, in uh, unless you were, you know, back in the healthcare environment at that time, but. Arrow is talking about, and if you read through the article, it's it's not an exciting read, but it's not a difficult read either. But and as you read through it, it's like you know, here was healthcare at that time. There wasn't any, you know, not a lot of consistency in billing, not a lot of consistency in reimbursement. A lot of services were just being paid bill charge. Um, a lot, especially hospitals, were um, not for profit. You had a lot of, you know. Provider groups, not for profit, uh, just a, com a significantly different than the way it is now. And so things have changed over time, but some of the things that, that haven't changed, or at least in my perception or my, um, I guess, my approach to it, haven't changed is we still have issues with asymmetric information. You still have this agent principal issue between the patient and the provider. You have Issues of supplier-induced demand, or SID, as we've talked about the acronym on the provider side of the house. You have issues with quality of care. It's ex Quality of care is extremely difficult to measure. And even though we've made some leaps and bounds over, especially, let's say, since 2000, we've made a lot of leaps and bounds, we're still not where we need to be. It's still not um, a good or service that it is that is easily qualified or easily the quality of it is measured. And then lastly, you're, you're talking about uncertainty, uncertainty in healthcare and, and uncertainty to the incidence of disease and also uncertainty to the efficacy of treatments. And think about when we talk about incidence of disease, it is up until the last few years, it's been extremely difficult for providers to estimate what the demand for the services are going to be in any given time. I go back to 2019, early 2020. Nobody, I think, had, well, I can't say nobody. There may have been a few people that envisioned the impact of COVID, but very few in the healthcare market really understood what the potential impact of COVID would have been. And when, you, when you're trying to estimate supply and demand, especially on the healthcare provider side of the house, it's extremely difficult to adjust the supply providers with respect to the expectation and demand. Uh, think about going to medical school. Undergraduate, go to medical school, residency, internship, you may get a fellowship somewhere. And so there is a huge, the, the time horizon is huge from when, uh, the American Medical Association, American Hospital Association, you know, in conjunction with policymakers and, and grants and funding to teaching and research hospitals, it, it's extremely difficult to manage the ebbs and flows, and they really oscillate, but the ebbs and flows that you're going to see in the supply of not only um, 
those providing health care services, MDs, DOs, allied health type professionals, but think about the supply of nurses. It's extremely difficult to, to manage that supply of nurses that we're going to be providing patient care once either in the outpatient setting in a doctor's office or in a hospital. So that that's where that's where we, you know, it was an issue during Arrow's time, and to me, it's still an issue trying to get our arms around um, healthcare goods and services. Healthcare goods and services is a market economy. You've got you know, providers are, are generating these healthcare goods and services. They're looking, you know, just like any other market economy or any other production entity, they're looking at labor, they're looking at capital equipment, they're looking at, you know, natural resources or land is the, the main natural resource most people think about. They're looking at technology. And again, from an economist's perspective, technology is the technology of the production process. Not so much talking about, you know, motherboards, and, you know, speed of computers and, and that kind of thing. But you're looking at the technology of the production process. And from an economist's perspective, technology in the production process, you've got resources coming in goes through that black box that is the production function of the production process, spits out healthcare goods and services on the other side. And then in conjunction with that technology and the production process, you've also got the issue of entrepreneurship. Those individuals out there that are trying to um, significantly improve efficiency, significantly reduce costs based on efficiency improvements and to drive profits and partake in driving those profits. And you've got, at least now in the healthcare industry, while it's not perfect, we've at least got, and, and we talk about it, um, I guess, in some later modules of the course, but we talk about um, consistency in coding, consistency in the submission of claims, consistency to some degree in reimbursement. And it's the impact of all of the information flowing in from the patients, it flows into the providers, the providers take the information, provide the treatment protocols, then they turn around with that information and build the claims for their, or submit the claims either on a fit, HICFA 1500 or UBO4 back to the health plan or the payer side of the house. And the payer adjudicates those claims. And then at that point, the check is cut for the, the electronic transfer at this point in time, goes back to the provider with their invoice. And also, as it goes back to the provider with, you know, the explanation of check, the EOC, tells the provider, here's what we paid you for, and here's the services we denied, and a lot of information on that EOC. And at the same time, the explanation of benefit is shooting out to the members so that the members can look at that explanation of benefit and actually see what services that the payer is paying for in on their behalf. So a lot of a lot of moving parts, but at least there is Arrow's article, at least has it we've improved in consistency again in coding, claim submission, efficiency of the whole submission process, and actually reimbursement for services. So that's kind of the, the kind of what you need to kind of think about. And if you need to go back and either watch that video or review that article, uh, you know, certainly probably a good idea. And then we we spend a few minutes talking about the first chapter in the text that we have. Uh, and again, text, it's, it's you know, flat world publication. I like flat world. I like the way to present the information. And I like the way that kind of first chapter put things together. Because it, to me, it makes it easier to kind of to, to transition into healthcare uh, ethics. And the first chapter talks about morals. It talks about ethics. It talks about you know, meta ethics. Talks about spends a few minutes talking about it. It is the senior leaders of an organization that set the culture of that organization. And when you're talking about setting culture, you're looking at you know at the ends. Where do you want to be at the end of the day? And then you have to make a decision on what means justify the ends. You know, how do you go about developing the strategy to get from point A to point B? Or what means you incorporate, what means your teams incorporate to get from point A to point B. And then I actually like the the down toward the end of that first chapter, they they talk about you know two approaches to business ethics. 
One approach, which I probably don't disagree too much with, is you know you need to you know from an ethical perspective, there needs to be policies and procedures in place because you need to manage the hell out of ethics. They talk about in the text that you know all you know all you know leaders in industry or all you know leaders in you know in the business world. You know, they're liars or unethical. You can't trust them. I'm not sure I'd go maybe to that extreme and say they all are. But to some extent, I believe in, you know, the French legal system. You're guilty into proven innocent. If you, you know, watched anything about the French legal system, it's kind of their approach. Everybody's guilty into proven innocent. And a lot of providers, especially given my time in payment integrity and, and working in fraud, waste, and abuse, trying to get my arms around uh, the claims payment process and ensure those claims are paid accurately as, as frequently as possible, you almost have to take that approach that everybody's guilty and to prove an innocent. And especially in the healthcare marketplace, I find that happening a lot. Um, you identify, um, ever health, you know, billing and, you know, coding policies and you open an audit and you start you know, sifting through the data, sifting through the claims information, looking at the itemized bills, looking at the, you know, the medical record to make sure the services are notated in the medical record to justify those services that have been billed by the provider. And it, it get it is extremely frustrating because you'll start seeing, I mean, it's, I don't want to say easy to see patterns, but you start seeing these patterns. And the first thing that the provider will say when, when you approach them is, you know, you've done a sample audit and you're, you see this pattern approaching and you send them out the letter that you're opening a full audit on. The first thing they say is, oh, no, it's not me. I, I didn't do anything. It must be my billing department. It must be the nurses that are doing it. But it's, you know, somebody besides me. Um, but at the end of the day, they're the provider. They have to accept that responsibility. It's their business. Um, and then so to some extent, I kind of I, I kind of think that first approach applies to healthcare because the second one is, you know, they, they talk about leave the business alone. As long as the market, you know, is functioning uh, to, to optimize the welfare of society, just leave them alone and let, let the market take care of it. You know, let supply and demand, let, let Adam Smith, you know, and his, his wealth and nation talk about that invisible hand, those forces that are going to drive supply and demand are going to get them to that equilibrium price and quantity of, of healthcare goods and services provided. I think that approach probably works fairly well with a lot of market economies but I'm not sure it works that well with healthcare. I think there are too many underlying inconsistencies in healthcare and too many, and I'll call them actors, whether it's patients, health plans, providers, public policy, you know, makers. I think there are too many bad actors in the healthcare environment to allow the market to adjust itself, to allow the market supply and demand to take care of itself. And part of that reason, at least from my perspective, is that in healthcare, we aren't consumer centric. We aren't as transparent as we need to be. Yes, I can get out on, um, well, we're with, and I'm with Aetna right now, I was with Anthem, I'm with Aetna as far as the health plan, but I can get out on Anthem's on Aetna's website and I can pull up Dr. Smith and I can see Dr. Smith went to medical school at University of Pennsylvania did a residency at, you know, Children's Hospital in University of Pennsylvania, maybe, you know, did an internship at the VA. I mean, everything, if you've ever been to University of Pennsylvania's campus, everything sits, you know, kind of in a wall there around campus. So, and, you, and you see that to some extent. Um, when I worked in Buffalo, everybody went to University of Buffalo to medical school. They did the research. They did their internship there. They did the residency there. There was, every, you know, kind of a homogeneous thought. At, you know, in the Buffalo market. And fortunately, you'd like to see a little heterogeneous thought because I think it makes for, for you know, a better uh, healthcare provider. But what you end up with, if, if you're not careful, is you're looking at this information 
on on the website of, of whichever health plan, if, if you're in if you're at Fisk, you may be, you know, Tennessee Blue, let's say is your health plan, or you may have United, or you know, you may have some other health plan, but you're looking on the website and yeah, you can tell what they went to medical school, residency, internship, but it didn't tell you really anything about their provider. Yeah, they tell you what languages they speak, they sometimes give you a picture. Uh, and what <laughs> What I always found really interesting is when you're looking at that is you get on the website and, you know, you're sitting there looking at, you know, at the picture of this, you know, this position. And, you know, I know when I went to, when I was in an undergraduate, work on my undergraduate degree, and I know when I went to graduate school and I'm looking at this dude, and, you know, he went, you know, he graduated from undergraduate, you know, about the same time I did, you know medical school, which I'm, you know, I'm doing the calculations, and he looks like, you know, looks like a, you know, bodybuilder, looks like he's like, his picture looks like he's like 40, 40, 45 years of age, you know, great physical shape, and I'm sitting there, and I said, there is no way that guy looks that good in person, and sure enough, you pick him, and you go to him, and, you know, he's probably in worse physical condition than I am when he comes hopping into the exam room. So again, when it comes to business ethics, I'm not sure that you can let the market take care of it. I think, you know, I think it's at least a combination, but I'm saying it's going to lean more toward the first one. Um, when we're talking about, you know, the financial coin, and there's, I have a video out there, probably it's in module one, two, probably maybe the third module out there. When we're talking about the financial coin, there is a financial coin out there. Remember, we had, what did I say, four and a half trillion dollars in healthcare spend in 2022, something like 25% waste and abuse, seven to 10% of, you know, probably fraudulent activities. And so you've got the payers on one side of that financial coin, and you've got the providers on the other side of that financial coin, and they're struggling over that financial coin. Both, both. Both health plans and providers want to make a profit. They're really struggling over that financial coin. And if they don't have the resources to do it internally, they're reaching out to third-party vendors to help them. On the, the health plan side, you're reaching out to third-party vendors to help you with payment integrity to ensure that those claims pay accurately when they come in. If you're on the provider side, you're reaching out to third-party vendors to help you do revenue cycle management because you know, you're wanting to optimize. If you're a provider, you're trying to optimize revenues. If you're on the health plan side or on the payer side, you're trying to minimize healthcare expenditures. Those two, those two optimization tactics don't mesh. Remember, go back to, and, and one thing I want to make sure everybody understands is if you go back to just the basic principles of economic thought, those three pillars, you're talking about opportunity cost, you're talking about self-interest, optimization, maximization, minimization. You're talking about decisions at the margin. It's that middle one, that self-interest that drives it, that drives a lot of the ethical issues in healthcare. And it doesn't matter whether you're the patient, you're the health plan, you're the provider, you're the policymaker. It's that self-interest. Self-interest is driving a lot of the ethical healthcare issues that we're confronted with in the healthcare environment. And right now, that struggle over that financial coin, if you'd asked me five years ago who was winning, I would say, absolutely. It's, it's, it's probably neck and neck. It, it's, I, I can't really tell a difference. And then probably in 16, 2016, 2017, 2018, you saw this real boost, maybe even 2015, you saw this real boost on the provider side where they started making, you know, they started really gaining ground. They were recovering dollars. They were bringing dollars back with, you know, providers should talk about clawing it back. They were clawing back the dollars from these claims that had either inaccurately processed or providers had fraudulently billed these services. However, over the last year or so, I've seen the providers starting to make some improvement. They they figured out they need these third party vendors because you've got these third party vendors. They're selling 
payment integrity services to health plans, same third-party vendors are turning around and selling revenue cycle management consulting services to the providers, and it's enabling these providers to start to gradually catch up. So at some point, um, one is going to just overtake the other. So it's, it's in, and again, it's, I think the providers over the last few years have had the advantage, but I'm not sure. It looks to me like the, I mean, the health plans have had the advantage, and I'm not sure that the providers aren't starting to catch up. Um, see, what else did I think you should look at? Um, oh, talking about um, the economic, I want to make sure we had a session talking about the economic fundamentals, again, that's driving, and I talked about the opportunity cost, the self-interest, the, um, the decisions at the margin, but what is you know really driving it is that is that profit function. Profit is revenue, total revenue minus total cost. I don't care whether you're on the health plan side or the provider side. Profit is revenues minus cost. On the health plan side, they're selling um, benefit plans and contracts to either individuals, government agencies, employer groups to drive the revenue. They've got the internal cost you know, legal, medical management, network management, payment integrity, IT, uh, internal audit. On the provider side, they're selling healthcare goods and services to drive that revenue, and they're trying to manage their costs. They're trying, they're struggling. The health plan's struggling with marginal product of labor, and the providers are also struggling with that marginal product of labor. They're trying to improve efficiency and drive those costs down so they can maximize revenues. And again, if you remember, we talked about it. If I'm a provider and I see five patients an hour and I work eight hours a day, so that's essentially 40 patients that I can see in that day. And if I start playing around with the codes or I start playing around with the services I provide each time a patient comes into my office, I can actually significantly bump my revenue without seeing any more patients. I'm just maximizing the revenue on each one of those patients that I see. Again, decisions at the margin. I'm making marginal decisions. If I'm a provider, I can bump that revenue, not see any more patients, and I can do it by playing around with, and we, you know, we've talked about it, with the codes. I can play around with the codes. I can play around with the way I complete the HICFA 1500 or the UB04. And for the most part, I can do it, you know, let's say do it $200 a day. And I think at $200 a day, I think I calculate there's about 250 work days that the provider has to work by the time you take out weekends, holidays, vacation stuff. $200 a day, 250 days, I think make an initial 50,000 bucks and not see any more patients. So it's that profit margin that's driving both the health plan and it's also driving the provider side. Now, if we go back to the patients, it's disposable income. Everybody right now with inflation running rampant as it is, we're all struggling with disposable income. We've paid out a premium for our health care benefit plan or our health care contract that we have bought from whichever health plan covers you. And you're looking at it as hey, I'm going to, I paid my premium. And a lot of, a lot of patients look at it. A lot of members do. They paid their premium and they're going to what? Self-interest. They're going to optimize those benefit plans. They're going to, they're going to scratch every bit of goods and services they can out of that benefit plan. Not only that, when they go into a provider's office, and let's say you get hurt at work. They go into provider's office, and even though the provider says, well, you hurt at work, because there's a there's some boxes on that HIPAA 1500 that says, you have you been hurt at work? And if the patient is honest and says yes, then the doc needs to check that. And as that bill comes in, it may not be paid by your medical plan. It may go to your workers' compensation plan that your employer has. So Patients are driving this overutilization because of moral hazard and the fact that they're trying to optimize their benefit plans. 
payers are struggling uh, when it comes to means to an end. You've got you've got network management, medical management, payment integrity, internal audit, trying to squeeze those healthcare expenditures for the health plan. And if you ever work for a health plan and you're in a meeting, you will hear the the individual, especially if it's actuary, you'll hear them now talk about, well, you know, this year we're going to bend that healthcare, we're going to bend that healthcare curve. And so what they're saying is, if they if the healthcare expenditures have been increasing, let's say five percent over the last two or three years, when they're talking about bending that curve, they're talking about hitting that inflection point, and now they're going to start maybe this. 2025, rather than four or five percent, they want that health care trend to increase two to three percent. So they're talking about bending that curve. So that's the end that they that's the goal that the health plan wants to be in. And what means are they going to use to get to that end? And herein your ethical dilemma. Your, you know, this where morals and ethics come into it. Do you use network management to squeeze every nickel you can out of that those provider contracts? Do you use medical management to go in there and 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 increase the number of prior authorizations or increase the the referral process? Do you want a payment integrity team like I directed to to get really aggressive and start auditing, just auditing claim after claim after claim? So. And that's what goes back to your your senior management team of that health plan. And if you're a senior management team of a equity-based health plan, so when I say equity-based, it's traded on one of the exchanges, one of the stock exchanges. You know, I've you know I've worked for Aetna, I've worked for HealthNet or Centene, it's what they call themselves now. I've worked for United, all of them equity-based, and Equity-based health plans are concerned about earnings per share, concerned about keeping the stockholders happy. Not-for-profit, which some of the blues plans are, Anthem's not, but some of the blues plans are not-for-profit. And they're more concerned about community. They're more concerned about keeping the patients happy, more concerned about access to care and quality of care. But at the same time, they've got to make money They've got to drive profit or they're not going to stay in business. So that's that's your dilemma that you're facing when you're on the, the payer side. <clears throat> if you're on the provider side, again, we're trying to maximize revenues, trying to manipulate that total revenue minus total cost, trying to maximize the red total revenue, trying to minimize total cost. And providers, as I've talked about, they can do it with upcoding. They can do it what they call unbundling. So claims services supposed to be bundled together under one code and they take part, parse them apart and try to bill them separately. And on the hospital side, it's you know itemized bill review. You're trying to inflate those itemized bills. You've got what we referred to earlier as DRG creep. So you've got a lot of activity going on on that provider side and they're doing it with some type of combination of playing with the codes are playing with the information that's submitted on that HIPAA 1500 or the UBO form. They're going to drive that revenue. And then lastly, we've got our buddies at the public, you know, public agencies, you know, public health. You know, they, they love these normative statements. You know, here's the way you should do it, or here's the way it ought to be done. They're not really that concerned with how it actually happens or how reality sets in. But again, normative statements. And at that point, if you're a representative or a senator and you're pushing some kind of a new health care policy through the system, not only, you know, they're talking about whether well, we're doing it for the welfare and, and, you know, society as a whole. At the same time, though, they're trying to figure out how much of that money can I get down to my constituents? How much can I get back into my voting district? And at that point, you run into an inability to manage funds allocate resources? Do they actually make it to the needy population or the resources going to somebody's pocket? So again, you've got the four main actors that, that, are, that, that are driving that four and a half, you know, four and a half trillion dollars, patients, health plans or payers, providers, public health, public agencies, government agencies. 
And then lastly, one thing I, I want you to just focus on, um, remember that healthcare ethics takes a lot from business ethics, especially on the morals and the ethical side of the house, but they also are driven by bioethics. And we talked about this, we talk about, you know, the four kind of pillars of bioethics, you've got autonomy, and that is patients have a right of control. You go in to see your provider, and there you are, there are, true, there are some providers, and I've had several of them along the way, they want to dictate to you. They're going to dictate. They're going to, it's almost like they're going to ram it down your throat. But they, they, you're, a, you're, a, you're a patient. You don't have to agree with it. You have to provide informed consent, or the providers have to have your informed consent before they can especially um, conduct a some kind of a surgical procedure. Um, you want a provider that's going to educate, not dictate. You want one that's going to educate and say, "Look, here's here's what I think. We're going to we're going to get some some tests to to help me ensure that's what that what I think is correct. And once we get these tests, then I'm going to provide you some options. I'm going to provide you three or four options that I think will be suitable, and I think will drive the best possible." Uh, opportunity for you to have a positive outcome. And again, you're the patient. You drive. You've got to make that decision. You've got to drive that decision. Then you got benefits. Um, and that's, you know, patients, you, providers are supposed to act. Um, when you're talking about benefits, they're supposed to act in your, by your best interest. They should be concerned about managing your health status. They should be giving you treatment options, especially treatment options are going to optimize um, your, the totality of your health status, or at least at a minimum to help deter the depreciation or the degradation of your health status. And the third one is non-malfeasance. No harm to the patients. And when I say no harm to the patients, I'm talking about from neglect, from misinformation, from incompetence. And it goes back to autonomy. If you're a patient and you're sitting in a doctor's office and you're uncomfortable with what that provider is telling you, it's okay to get up and walk out. I've done it on multiple occasions. I've told them, I can, rem I can rem remember... In Buffalo, um, and I had a fantastic primary care doctor. She was, you're talking about a rock star. And she worked for one of the large medical groups in Buffalo. And, you know, I, I met her because I was working for Blue Cross Blue Shield. And um, I used her and she was, you couldn't find one any better. I mean, she, again, she had, I think she'd been in, in charge of primary care um, at the hospital of, you know, in, in University of Pennsylvania. And, and she came in and just, again, and I still touch base with her if I need some information, you know, pick up a phone call. Or, she moved to the VA system in, in Western New York, got tired of the BS she had to put up with with this large medical group, so she just left. And so she called me, told me she's leaving, but said, if you know, if I need anything, give her a call. So I went to schedule an appointment with, you know, who was taking the first thing in place. Well, you know, typical, I couldn't get in to see them for like two weeks. And so they said, well, we got this nurse practitioner. So, okay, I'll give her a shot. I go and talk to this nurse practitioner, and, you know, I've, I've had, you know, had some back pain and had been having trouble sleeping because the back pain, and I'm telling her what the symptoms are, and, and I told her, you know, what, what my primary, what, you know, what Laura had, had, had done in the past, and you know, what we'd found worked well. And, you know, this nurse practitioner, you know, she gets up on her soapbox, and she's you talking about lecturing and dictating. She talked to me like I was just a complete clue. And, you know, she's not going to prescribe medication, and I'm going to have to agree to go to see a physical therapist, you know, five days a week and just gonna cost me a you know forty dollar copay every time I go and yada 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 and and you know, I finally looked at it and said look 
So this is my work. You're either gonna help me get from point A to point B and continue the uh, treatment protocol that you know that that Sarah, I guess her name was Sarah, that Sarah had had put together for me. Yeah, it's not gonna work. And she looked at me and she said, Look, I'm your nurse practitioner. I'm your provider now, and this is what I'm going to tell you to do. And I said, <laughs> said, no, you're not. I stood up and said, you know, I am so glad that I came in here and met you. I said, this is, this is not a huge issue for me. I said, I'm in some discomfort, but, you know, I, I can probably make by, make do on this. I said, I'm glad I didn't have to come in and see you for something that was really serious. And I looked and I said, why don't you just have a good day? And I walked out shut the door. She actually followed me down the hall, screaming at me, but well, you can't walk out on me like this. I'm your nurse practitioner. I turned around. And I said, why don't you just watch me? And, and at some point you have to take, you have to, if you get in a situation like this, you have to take control from a malfeasance perspective. This individual was incompetent. She was going to do harm to me as a patient not because of neglect, not because of really misinformation of something I'd given her. She was just incompetent. And then lastly, it's justice. And, you know, and you, you need to treat the patients fairly. Providers need to be fair. They need to provide equitable care. They can't provide or they can't withhold care based on age or, or sex or race or socioeconomic conditions. Everybody has to be treated fairly. And from a justice perspective, sometimes that's difficult for providers to do. And with that, I think that's probably going to take care of what you need to review when it comes to um, your midterm. And again, if you're studying for your midterm and you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Talk to everybody later. Thank you.